Hello? Romans chapter 8, the fourth time. This is New Testament video 449, Romans lesson 28. Dear Heavenly Father, may this be a profitable time and thy word rightly divided. Thank you. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, men. Romans 8 We aim to analyze a single verse in this lesson. As I will point out This is a most confused verse. Uh, the verse is not confusing. People who mistreat the verse are confusing because they are confused about the verse. We endeavor to avoid their error, their false teaching. Consequently, we go to great lengths to make certain that we understand what the verse is teaching as well as what it does not teach. Reading Romans 8 1 to 17 We must review the previous studies of Romans 8, which are three in number. Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Verse 12, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. 
For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Verse 17, our current lesson. Romans 8, 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. Since verse 17 requires much comment, we need to quickly cover those prior 16 verses. We've already dealt with them verse by verse, individually, meticulously, in great detail, that we may treat Romans 8.17 likewise, we must move rapidly through those first 16 verses in review. So, we have the context of verse 17. Romans 8.1 There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. I've said it numerous times now. Repeat. Repeat, 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 repeat. The condemnation of Romans 8 1 has a context, doesn't it? This is not condemnation to hell, the lake of fire. The context is Christian service. Christian service. The homoiotel tell you of verse 1 and verse 4 is not a burden to us. The same ending the repetitious phrase there, verse 1, verse 4, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit, is not an inadvertent duplicate, a copyist error, as is frequently asserted, It is a repetition. The Holy Spirit wrote through Paul so that we may get it through our thick skulls. Romans 7, living according to our resources in Adam. I can produce the Christian life. Supply me with a list of rules and regulations and I'll make God happy with me. He'll smile. Give me a right standing and usher me into heaven. Look what I did. <laughs> Foolish. Foolishness. Romans chapters 1 to 5, justification, 
have already made it plain. We are not perfect. Our performance is imperfect. We are powerless. We're dead in our trespasses and sins. What can we do for God? Uh, nothing. Nothing. Ooh! That's a blow to my ego. Yes, it is. Mine too. Get over it. What we have merited, what we deserve, is a hot condominium in the universe's garbage dump, the lake of fire. Yes, that's, that's what sin gets us. The law condemns everyone as a sinner. All are sinners. All have fallen short of God's glory. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Instead of being obsessed, isn't that descriptive? Obsessed with our righteousness. We should look to Calvary where God's righteousness was on display. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day. The gospel of grace. Grace. Not law. Grace. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 and 4. Acts 20 verse 24. The Christian life begins at Calvary. It is based on Calvary. How will the Christian life thereafter function? Uh, on the basis of Calvary? Who worked at Calvary? Did we work? No. Christ worked. God the Father set him forth as a propitiation, a fully satisfying payment or sacrifice for sin, our sin. Do we believe that in our heart, soul, or not? This is not an intellectual, mental ascent. This is heart faith, genuine soul trust. With the heart, man believes unto righteousness. Anyway, that's Romans 1 to 5. Justification. Have a right standing before God, in front of God, with God, because we are in Christ. And we have His righteousness. We have God's righteousness in Christ. When we place our faith exclusively in Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, He died to pay for our sins. His sinless blood was shed to cover our sins. If we couldn't work to be in a right standing with God, does it make sense that we now work in the Christian life to have a right standing before God? No. It's not law, it's grace. What God can do for sinners, all that God can do for us sinners. Through Calvary, the Lord Jesus Christ's finished, finished, Crosswork. We are not supplementing the crosswork. We are not enhancing the crosswork of Christ. We are appreciating it, esteeming it, valuing it.
valuing it. So, if Christ was on the treadmill at Calvary and he performed perfectly, and that's how our Christian life began, it will continue in the same manner. We aren't on the treadmill, Christ is. Alright, now, Romans 6, 7, and 8. I have to speed this up. Romans 6, 7, and 8. The next part of Romans. This is sanctification. Being set apart, made holy, being hallowed, being set apart under God's purpose, the purpose for which we all were created. In Christ. Romans 6, Romans 7, Romans 8. Loops back to the gospel of grace in the prior chapters. Romans 6, we are dead to sin in Christ. Sin is not our master. The sin nature, the Adamic nature, is not our authority. We are not under the law, we're under grace. Grace! We have been crucified with Christ. We have been raised again with Christ to walk in newness of life. See, it goes back to Calvary again. We are freed from sin. The nature. Romans 7. We are dead to the law. The law. The performance-based acceptance system. Work to gain the blessing. Perform to get fellowship with the Lord. Living the Christian life. No, we don't live the Christian life. Only Christ can live his life. Romans 7. Since Paul, in his daily living there, went back to the law system, the dispensation of the law, assuming God was still doing that, Well, Romans 7, Paul wound up in a mess. He was troubled, defeated, disappointed, frustrated, exhausted, miserable, annoyed, distraught, distressed, worked up, stressed out, unhappy. Yeah, well, that's most of Christendom too. Romans 7, because they're back on their treadmill. Instead of heeding the gospel of the grace of God, they're listening, they have their ear toward the law of Moses. It's not God's fault. They need to remember the dispensation of the grace of God as found in Paul's epistles. Romans to Philemon. 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 We favor the law. Moses and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We follow Jesus. <laughs> uh, Jesus was under the law. The law of Moses. You can't read Matthew to John, can't you? Today, Christ's heavenly ministry is in effect. Not his earthly ministry, heavenly ministry. The Lord through Paul. Romans 7. The struggle of Romans 7. The trap of Romans 7. You need to relearn Romans 6. 
Well, that's the purpose of Romans 8. Romans 8 provides us with the clue, the key, as to how to escape the prison of chapter 7, bondage to sin. Sin will be strong when we use the law, because the law says work to get the blessing. Grace says God worked and gave the blessing. See? Romans 8 opens with how we get out of that self-condemnation, that divine condemnation of service of chapter 7, Romans 8, 1 to 4. We in Christ Jesus, believers, should walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Romans 8, we are alive unto God by the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. Romans 6, dead to sin. Romans 7, dead to the law. Romans 8, alive unto God. You don't need to be a genius here. Thank you, Lord. Few of those anyway. Romans 8, 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. My Christian life does not have to die because the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, that principle is true. 3. For what the law could not do, make us righteous in that it was weak through the flesh, our flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Christ lived His life on earth, and He died as our sinless sacrifice. For that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Repeating verse 1. The righteousness of the law, the standard of the law, the strict, rigid, absolute standard of the law is fulfilled in us. We who walk not after the flesh, I can live the Christian life. No. But who walk after the Spirit, Christ alone can live the Christian life. Ah, there. No more treadmill for us. He's on it. Instead, there will be no misery, disappointment, defeat, unhappiness there with Him. So Paul elaborates, the Holy Spirit through Paul elaborates, Romans 8, 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind thinking about the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because a carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. It all comes down to thinking. We will either think properly or think improperly. If it is not the grace of God renewing our mind, then it's the law. It's the flesh. It's sin controlling us ruining us, defeating us, conquering us. What a loss of joy it is. 
Amen, 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 amen. Fleshly thinking. Thinking like a person instead of like the Lord. Thinking like a lost man instead of a saved man. The Spirit of God will teach us. Do we want to learn? Or do we revel in languishing in I know most of us do because it's easier to do that than think about Bible verses, study Bible verses, and believe Bible verses. See? I follow the church. I follow the professor. I follow the preacher, the teacher. They'd never lie to me. Well, I hope not, but I really doubt that. The carnal mind, the fleshly mind, the mind Depending on human intellect, that mind is God's enemy. That will not generate the Christian life. We should be looking at Romans to Philemon, where the Spirit of God talks to us now. Romans to Philemon. Now, we study all the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, but 2 Timothy 2.15, rightly dividing the word of truth. What is God's word to and about us? And what is God's word for our learning? What is God doing now? It's not everything in the Bible. But what is in Romans to Philemon? See? Where are we in the Bible canon? On the Bible timeline? Most of us don't know. It's not God's fault. No, no, no. It's our fault. We spend too much time listening to the preachers, teachers, professors, priests, popes and pundits instead of heeding the Holy Spirit through Paul. Romans 8 8 So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God but ye are not in the flesh but in the Spirit if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ he is none of his. Those without Christ, they cannot please God because all they have is the flesh. Their resources in Adam. That sin nature, which has good and evil, and yet in God's sight it's all evil because it's either human evil or human good, and human good is self-righteousness. God wants none of it. Human evil or human good. Because it isn't the life of Christ. It's someone trying to copy Him. Pass themselves off as Him. God isn't fool. We can fool the preacher. We can fool the teacher. The professor. Look! Somebody who serves God. Somebody is God's child. But God is a tricked. 
We can fool some people some of the time. But we cannot fool all the people all of the time. And we can fool God none of the time. <laughs> amen, 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 amen. The Spirit of God dwells in us, nine. So we should rely on Him, not on ourselves. That is how the Christian life will be brought to pass in our life. Romans 8, 10. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by a Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. This is practical resurrection. Remember? Romans 7, death, 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 death. Practical death, functional death. The Christian life not functioning, operating. Because it's Paul, it's a fleshly Christian. Trying to live the Christian life. Mm -mm. Functional death. We need life and peace instead of that uneasiness, that the stress of Romans 7. Romans 8, 11. The Holy Spirit will quicken, give life to, and activity to our mortal body. Verse 12. We don't owe the flesh anything. I have to sin. No, no, that's a lie. Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Sons of God. Working with Father God in the family business of glorifying His Son, Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, the Trinity, Godhead. The Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ. The Spirit, all three. The Spirit of God will lead us according to sound Bible doctrine that we read and believe in our heart, taking the principles of grace, Romans to Philemon, and applying them to life by faith. That's how God's will is accomplished in our life. He's working in us. The Word of God effectually works in them that believe. Sons, full-grown adults, not children, not babies, infants, newborns, Mm -mm. Romans 8, 15. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, the law, the law, but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Mature believers who have the indwelling Holy Spirit He links us to the adoption. The adoption. God taking believers and declaring them full grown sons who can do the work of the ministry, 
who know what he is doing and by faith can do it too. They are simply walking in their identity he gave them in his beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Abba Father, intimate, personal, not my will, but thine be done. There's a mature son. Not a slave, a servant. Oh, I have to do it! No, the son is, I delight in doing it. Hmm. This isn't drudgery. This is love and gratitude in motion. We are not under the law, we're under grace. Romans 6. If you want to be under the law, look at Romans 7. Want to be under grace? Look at Romans 8. Romans 8, 16. The Spirit itself, the Spirit functioning there, the Spirit itself, His function. Numa, 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 is without gender, Spirit which is why the reflexive pronoun is also without gender itself. The role of the Holy Spirit there is to bear witness, bear record, bear testimony of. Of what? Romans 8, 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We are his offspring. See? Not everyone is God's child. We are children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3, 26. We believers are the children of God. Romans 8, 17. And, here is our present lesson, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. So the thought is completed. Verse 16, verse 17, or one sentence. Unfortunately, verse 17 it's so controversial, I had to devote one lesson to it. I couldn't fit it into the prior study. Romans 8, 17, in light of that controversy, is a challenge to teach, exposit. Therefore, we will go light on it at first and delve into deeper matters in layers. Romans eight seventeen. And if children, if we are children of God, 16, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. Heirs. We're heirs. See that? Heirs. Inheritance. 
We are recipients of an apportionment or distribution. We are heirs of God. Galatians 4. Galatians 4. 7. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Galatians 4, by the way, is also about adoption. As in Romans 8, 15. When we reach Romans 8, 23 where adoption is mentioned again, I will elaborate what precisely is the adoption. There's enough to handle here in Romans 8, 17. Romans 8, 17. We're heirs of God, Romans 8, 17, and joint heirs with Christ. Joint heirs. Joint is joined, sharing, sharing. Heirs who have an equal share. They are qualified for the inheritance, to receive the inheritance. Psalm 2, Psalm 2, verse 8. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. That is the Father talking to the Son. Father God to Jesus Christ, the Son. That's His reign. Reigning as a ruler. Okay. Hebrews 1. 1. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Heir of all things. The Son is the heir of all things. Acts 20, 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Inheritance. Galatians 3, 29. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Acts 26, 18. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Ephesians 1, 11. in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. 14. That Holy Spirit of promise, 13, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Ephesians 3, 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of His promise in Christ by the Gospel. Colossians. 
Colossians 1 verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light inheritance. Colossians 3, 24. Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. There's the reward of the inheritance. For ye serve the Lord Christ. Titus 3, 7. That being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now, those references concern us, the church, the body of Christ. Look at redeemed Israel. Hebrews 1, 14. Are they not all ministering spirits, angels, sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Hebrews 6, 12. That ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Hebrews 9.15 And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. 1 Peter 1.4 to an inheritance incorruptible and defiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. So Israel and the inheritance, Hebrews and First Peter. Romans 8. 17. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Suffering. Suffering with Christ. Well, Christ suffered, didn't he? Hebrews. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a count of witnesses, the people of faith, the saints of chapter 11, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Christ had sound Bible doctrine in his mind. There's a glorious future ahead. So I can endure the cross. Something ahead is coming that's far better than what I have now here on Calvary. The suffering. Unimaginable suffering. Unspeakable. Well, Romans 8 has our sound Bible doctrine for us to believe so we can endure the suffering. Second Timothy 2, 1 and 2. Therefore, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Hardships. Now, that is Romans 8.17, light. <laughs> we will go through Romans 8.17 again in a more advanced form. 
Several years ago, there was a controversy in the online grace community. I remember it well. I wrote a Bible study. I will read that Bible study to you. It's long. Okay. There are a lot of verses to read. I have included in the description of this video a link to the online study that I wrote and posted on our website of Bible Questions and Answers. Let me get right to reading this study for you, this Bible study article. Regrettably, in recent years, especially on social media, our grace brethren have allowed the pettiest and most preposterous of ideas to divide us. One case in point is a rare handling of Romans 8.17. Let us read the verse as it appears in the King James Bible. Romans 8.17 and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. Sadly, fellow believers in Christ, however sincere, have greatly damaged this most precious scripture, allowing human sentiment emotions to blind their spiritual eyes, dull their spiritual ears, and harden their spiritual hearts. They have been deceived and thus introduced needless confusion, concern, and discouragement. We will shed much needed light on this matter. Confusion, confusion, confusion. Dear friends, this author has read innumerable online posts written by people on both sides of the issue. Some souls have even emailed him in total bewilderment and complete exasperation. They cannot see what either side is contending as touching Romans 8.17. Others are totally fed up and cannot bear to see anything else written about it. Some discussions are bitter, others are quite absurd. When God's word is tossed aside and sinful man sits as judge, should we expect anything else but spiritual disaster? Frankly, as is often the case about Bible topics, there is so much Ignorance. Ignorance. There is great discussion about Romans 8.17, an enormous amount of heat being generated, but so little substance and almost no light. Emotions, unfortunately, have usually taken precedence on both sides. Christians have become so caught up in writing or speaking that they have overlooked the simplicity of the verse. Four years on, it is high time we settle the matter here. For anyone seeking clarification, we humbly offer this Bible study. We will set aside all opinions of men and let the Scriptures speak for themselves. For what saith the Scriptures? Verse 17 
17 can be and has been misconstrued to promote a works religion system. For simplicity's sake, we will hereafter refer to this idea as conditional joint airship. The basic premise is thus. While all Christians are children of God, and all Christians are heirs of God, only some Christians are joint heirs with Christ. Proponents of this system base their argument on the following phrase in the verse, If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. If so be contains three simple one-syllable English words, so it is absolutely mind-boggling how people stumble over them. Whether they do so in complete sincerity or deliberate ignorance, they struggle to grasp the verse. Dear friends, let the Holy Spirit teach you. It is simple. Do not complicate the Bible. Leave that for lost people to do. <laughs> Set aside your traditions. Turn off the preachers and put down the commentaries. Give the Holy Scriptures the chance to speak. Clarity, clarity, clarity. If so be. The Greek word, a pair, or I pair. E I P E R. Epsilon, iota. P, epsilon, rho. A pair, I pair. The Greek word translated if so be, I pair, a pair, is used only five times in the New Testament Bible. Glance at these instances now, Romans 8, 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be. I pair, a pair. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Romans 8, 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be, I pair, a pair, that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. 1 Corinthians 15, 15. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He raised not up, if so be, I pair, a pair, that the dead rise not. 2 Thessalonians 1.6 Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. I per, a per, is seeing there, seeing. Translated seeing. 1 Peter 2, the last reference. 1 Peter 2, 3. If so be, I per, a per, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. If so be, if so be, if so be, seeing, if so be. Romans 8, 9, Romans 8, 17, 1 Corinthians 15, 15, 2 Thessalonians 1, 6, 1 Peter 2, 3. If we just let the English Bible speak, we see that none of these verses are conditional as in, perhaps so, perhaps not. Maybe yes, maybe no. The quote from 2 Thessalonians is a simple example. Is God just or fair in paying back the enemies of his children? Why, yes he is. Paul is not saying, maybe it is a righteous thing with God. Maybe it is not a righteous thing with God. On the contrary, Paul is declaring in light of the fact, in light of that fact, that it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. 
in light of the fact that it is a righteous thing with God to give you rest with us. He will surely judge in flaming fire those who know Him not and who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Read 2 Thessalonians 1, 3 through 10. One lengthy sentence in Greek. And you will see the tenor we just delineated. It is a logical argument. Back to Romans 8, 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Is Paul questioning whether or not we have the indwelling Holy Spirit? Of course not. Read the context. We do have the Holy Spirit. He leads us. He bears witness with our spirit and so on. Verse 11. His spirit that dwelleth in you the Holy Spirit living inside us is certain. The Holy Spirit living inside Christians is certain. Factual. The Holy Spirit living inside Christians is not up for debate. This is not maybe, maybe not. And yet there's the if so be in Romans 8, 9, right? It would be contrary to God's nature to allow his spokesman, Paul, to introduce doubt in the minds of his people. The Holy Spirit permanently seals the inner man of the believer the moment he or she believes on the Lord Jesus Christ as personal Savior. Read those. 1 Corinthians 3.16 Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? See? It's certain. Definite. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and you are not your own? For you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. They belong to God. Ephesians 1, 12-14 that we should be to the praise of His glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. There's no doubt about it. Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. Ephesians 4.30 And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. 2 Timothy 1, 14. That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. Lost people are those without the Spirit of Christ. Romans 8, 9. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Since we are in the Spirit, we should act like we are in the Spirit, as opposed to acting sinful. Our daily behavior should reflect our Christian identity. That is the logic of Romans 8, 9. If the Holy Spirit dwells in us, shouldn't we have a life that reflects that truth? That's the if so be. If this is true, then that's true. Wait. The next instance of I per or a per. 1 Corinthians 15, 15. Yea, we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He raised not up. If so be that the dead rise not. Paul's not arguing 
Perhaps the dead will be resurrected. Perhaps not. No. He has taken the position of the Corinthians who have denied the possibility of resurrection. Check verse 12. Which is Christ's resurrection. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Pagan philosophy has deceived these Christians, so they now doubt a cardinal truth of Christianity. To combat the error, the Holy Spirit through Paul provides a series of rebuttals throughout chapter 15. In essence, this is what he is saying in chapter 15, verse 15. We are liars of God. For we preach to you that Jesus Christ arose. Since the doctrine of resurrection is a fabrication, then Jesus Christ did not arise as we alleged. See? Paul is not taking a maybe yes, maybe no approach here. So as to strengthen the yes position, he is dealing with the matter from the no persuasion. The if here is one of logic, as in sense. That is the sense of if in Romans 8, 9 and 2 Thessalonians 1, 6. I per a per e i p e or translated if so be in first Peter two three. Remember it was seeing in second Thessalonians one six. First Peter two three. If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. It's not saying, perhaps you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, perhaps you have not. The Apostle Peter's audience has already trusted or believed on Christ. See verse 7, 1 Peter 2, 7. Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. See, they're believers. They've already trusted Christ. They've already tasted that the Lord is gracious. 1 Peter 1, 1 Peter 2, these are believers. There is no doubt or uncertainty whatsoever. Since they have tasted that the Lord is gracious, they are spiritual babes who need to grow with the sincere milk of the word. Verse 2, 1 Peter 2, 2. See? It's logical. Romans 8, 9 is logical, if so be. 1 Corinthians 15, 15 is logical, if so be. 1 Peter 2, 3 is logical, if so be. 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 is logical, seeing. Nothing is being questioned, and that is especially evident in the Thessalonians' proof. Possibilities are not here, certainties are. In light of one fact, other facts can be introduced to rest thereupon. It is a flow of logic, a progression of thought. The remaining instance of a pair, I pair, is Romans 8, 17, the verse of controversy. However, now that we have gained the sense of the Greek term, as well as the English sense, Romans 8.17 is easy to grasp, provided we let the Bible speak for itself and not have a theological agenda to promote. Romans 8.17 again. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. Please note that, in accordance with our earlier analyses, the if so be of Romans 8.17 is not conditional. It is a progression of the thought, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If this is true, then that is likewise right. It is a flow of logic. The if children is not conditional or questionable. 
is the beginning of the argument's development. We are children. Therefore, we are heirs. We are suffering with Him. Therefore, we will be glorified with Him. Both ifs in Romans 8.17 are definite and logical. They are not conditional as in perhaps, perhaps not. This needs to be stressed again and again and again and again. Nothing is being questioned. Nothing is uncertain. The statements are factual and logical. See the parallel thoughts there in Romans 8.17? We're joint heirs with Christ. We suffer with Him. We will be glorified together. With, with, with. See? With, with, together. They're parallels. Beside, together, with. Those who embrace conditional joint heirship ignore these parallel thoughts of with him and together. The Bible said, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Those of conditional joint heirship persuasion read the verse by pairing joint heirs with Christ with suffering with him. That is not the way the verse should be read. The semicolon breaks up the thoughts, so they should not be strung together. Heirs of God, Romans 8, 17, and joint heirs with Christ, semicolon. If so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. Respecting the semicolon, we had better not overlook it. Two thoughts are apparent to us. Firstly, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, is one thought. Secondly, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together, is another thought. We do not divide the verse so that it reads, only those who suffer with Christ will be joint heirs with Christ. Otherwise, we will wind up in the conditional joint heirship trap. I hope you're following me as best as you can. Dear readers, let us re-illustrate the truths we have laid out thus far. If in Romans 8.17 should be understood as if that is the case, it is a flow of logic, not a conditional statement. An example of if being used as logical rather than conditional is as follows. If she is a college graduate, she should have learned how to spell correctly and use proper grammar. Try it again. Seeing as to it is cold outside, I will wear extra layers of clothing. Once more, enjoy God's word, if so be that he has given it to you. No is not an option in any of these cases, thereby eliminating the maybe yes, maybe no approach to the ifs here. The only choice is yes, that is the case, and since that is the case, this too is true. This is fact, and on the basis of that fact, we reveal a new fact. She graduated college, therefore she should have exceptional knowledge in spelling and grammar. We will have chilly weather today, so I will be sure to bring additional clothes. God has inspired, preserved, and translated His Word, for which cause we desire to read, study, and believe it. Friend, do you see how simple this all is? We have set aside emotions. We have disregarded preachers' interpretations and traditions of denominations. We have humbly submitted 
to the Holy Spirit teaching us using His words. There is no struggling, obscurity, doubt, vexation, dread, anger, or darkness. We just read the words on the pages of Scripture, compare verses, and let those divine words contradict whomever they oppose. Let God be true, but every man a liar, Romans 3, 4. If the Bible refutes pastor so-and-so, sister so-and-so, father so-and-so, brother so-and-so, doctor so-and-so, reverend so-and-so, so be it. That goes for me or any other grace leader as well. This needs to be stressed again and again and again and again. Now, another layer. What is the suffering of Romans 8.17? Another driving force behind the conditional joint airship position is the appeal to 2 Timothy 2.12. Since Romans 8.17 and 2 Timothy 2.12 both relate to suffering, it is automatically assumed that they are speaking of one and the same event. As these scriptures themselves testify, they are not the same idea. Romans 8.17 and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. 2 Timothy 2.12 If we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. If we deny Him, He also will deny us. These are two separate contexts and should not be combined. The suffering of Romans 8.17 is suffering under the curse of sin. Romans 8.18-25 read, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. That'll be our next study, Romans 8, 18 to 25. Who is suffering under the curse of sin? Do only mature believers experience sickness, disease, and death? No. These problems apply to all believers, mature and immature, and even unbelievers. <laughs> Did you notice how Romans 8, 18 to 25 fits nicely with the order of Romans 8, 17? There is suffering first, then glorification. A decaying creation will be followed by a renewed creation. A debilitating body will give way to a resurrected body. While Romans 8, 17 says suffer with him, there is no suffer with him in 2 Timothy 2.12. 2 Timothy states, suffer. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. There's no suffer with him there in 2 Timothy 2.12 as in Romans 8.17. Romans 8.17 is specific. So we have two independent contexts. 
This needs to be stressed again and again and again and again. There are two types of suffering under discussion. Let us turn back to Romans 8.17. Romans 8.17, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. Whatever we suffer, Jesus Christ feels our pain because we are so intricately connected with Him. He's the head, we are the body, we're the body parts. 1 Corinthians 12, He is suffering with us, but since He preceded us, the wording is that we are suffering with Him. We are one with Him. As in the physical world, the head senses the pain that one part of the body feels. He suffered under the curse of sin during His earthly ministry. He lived in a fallen world. He saw loved ones grow sick and die. We are still under the same curse, with bodies prone to sickness and death. Romans 8, 18-25, Genesis 3, where the curse of sin originated. We await the arrival of our new glorified bodies at the rapture. Just as Jesus Christ was and still is waiting for creation to be freed from the curse of sin. As He will be glorified one day, so we will be glorified with Him. Romans 8.17 And if children then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. The redemption of our body, that's our topic for next time. We'll look at 1 Corinthians 15, Philippians 3, 2 Thessalonians 1, and 2 Thessalonians 2. And our glorification with the Lord Jesus Christ. Our bodily, physical resurrection in the future. We'll deal with some of that here to lead up to the next study. The suffering of 2 Timothy 2 is something else. 2 Timothy 2 9-13 Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Paul's in bonds. Paul is punished here as an evildoer. He's suffering trouble. Second Timothy is at the end of Paul's earthly life. They will soon take his life, beheaded, supposedly, it was beheading, we don't know, the Bible doesn't specify. Paul is suffering. For the gospel's sake. His Gospel, 2 Timothy 2.8, 2 Timothy 2.10, Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sakes, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. There's the reigning with Him. Now verse 12, the glorification, eternal glory. We'll save that for our next study of Romans 8. God's word is not restricted, though sinful men can imprison God's men. I suffer trouble even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. They can't tie up 
the Word of God. They can't handcuff it, restrain it. Though Christ's messenger can be silenced, discouraged, or dead, his message will not be and will never be. <laughs> Paul is being persecuted as he writes that very passage. He has been arrested and is now sitting in a prison, suffering for the sake of preaching the gospel of grace. Now, that's not the Romans 8 suffering, huh? Under the curse of sin? No, this is persecution. 2 Timothy 2. Paul is suffering as a believer. In Romans 8, everybody's suffering, believers and unbelievers alike. They're all subject to sickness and death, physical death, pain and suffering. Amen, 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 amen. Nevertheless, such simple truths disappear as the conditional joint heirship confusion slips in. It is alleged that we must suffer for the mystery's sake before we can be joint heirs with Christ. We must, it is said, be persecuted for preaching Paul's special doctrine or we cannot be heirs in the heavenly places. <laughs> Being joint heirs is not a guarantee, they claim, as we may not suffer for the mystery's sake. And they grab Romans 8.17 as proof. This is an appalling mistreatment of the Bible. Such an approach is wrong for three reasons. We will gladly repeat the two mentioned earlier, and we will add a new refutation. Firstly, if suffering for the mystery's sake resulted in being a joint heir with Christ, then it would have been most appropriate for Paul to mention that in 2 Timothy chapter 2. After all, as that passage demonstrates, he was suffering for preaching his gospel, part of the mystery. Yet the word joint heir never once appears in 2 Timothy. Furthermore, there is no suffering with Christ here in 2 Timothy, as in Romans chapter 8. We would have to insert these words into Scripture without authority. Thus, we would be liars guilty of adding to God's pure words. Proverbs 35 and 6. Read them. Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. Add thou not unto His words, lest He reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Oh, a lot of that, huh? <laughs> yes. Do we really care to go that route? If that is our preference, we need to stop playing the hypocrite and just admit we really do not believe the Bible. If we must resort to changing Bible verses, our loyalty is to our theology and not our God. Oh, ooh. Secondly, as was already pointed out, of the five times a pair or I pair appears in the Greek Bible, it always serves as the most important link in the chain of logic. Never is doubt being gendered in any case. Romans 8, 9, if so be, logical. 1 Corinthians 15, 15, logical, if so be. 1 Peter 2, 3, if so be, logical. 2 Thessalonians 1, 6, seeing, logical. Nothing is being questioned, which is especially evident in the Thessalonians' proof. Mere possibilities are not here. Absolute certainties are. In light of the facts, other realities can be introduced to rest on the facts previously mentioned. It is a flow of logic. It is a progression of thought. The remaining instance of I pair, a pair, is Romans 8, 17. If so be, and it too is logical and not conditional. 
Thirdly, all Christians are joint heirs with Christ, just as all Christians are children of God and heirs of God. Romans 8, 17. Again, the if-so-be clause of Romans 8, 17 is logical, not conditional. Conditional being maybe, maybe not. Since there is great confusion, we will repeat yet again what has gone before. Romans 8, 17 begins, If children, then heirs. Are we God's children or not? Is Paul arguing perhaps yes, perhaps no here? Of course not. The if is not maybe you are God's children. The if starts a thought process. Verse 16 just claimed, We are the children of God. Definite, certain, not speculative. Since we are the children of God, verse 16, since we are His heirs by default, verse 17, the second if of verse 17 functions the same way as the first if in verse 17. If we suffer with Him, and we will, as this is definite, certain, not speculative, Verse 18, they're suffering, right? Then that suffering will eventually give way to glorification. As we share in His sufferings, so we will partake of His glorification. This is not conditional, but logical. Once again, go back to the first if of verse 17, and even glance up to verse 16, where the sentence starts. We are heirs of God, and we are joint heirs with Christ. Both are facts because of the truth that we are children of God. These three are facts, not possibilities or conditional ideas. They are absolute certainties. We are children of God. Since that is true, two other outcomes are also true. Firstly, we are heirs of God. Secondly, we are joint heirs with Christ. There is no hoping, wishing, or doubt here. We are heirs of God in that everything that belongs to Him belongs to us. Think of a father passing on his estate to his son. We are joint heirs with Christ in that what the father passes to him is transferred to us as well. We share his identity. For we are flesh of His flesh and bone of His bone, members of His body. Ephesians 5, 23-30 We are called Christ and the body of Christ for this very reason. 1 Corinthians 12, 12, 27 What exactly is this joint airship that all Christians have? For the remainder of this article, we will do a treatment of the joint airship as the Bible presents it. Alright, so, that was a little complicated, to put it mildly. Back to studying more cross-references now. The inheritance versus the reward of the inheritance. We should never confuse those two. The inheritance and the reward of the inheritance. The inheritance is not a reward. But there is a reward connected to the inheritance. The Bible treats them separately. The inheritance and the reward of the inheritance. The conditional joint heirship supporters need to pay attention here. Ephesians 1, Ephesians 1, verse 
Verse 8. Wherein he, Father God, hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. Inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed. Ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, under the praise of His glory. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints, Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of His calling, and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. Christ will inherit us. He will inherit something in us. And what is the exceeding greatness of His power to us who believe, according to the working of His mighty power, which He wrought in Christ when He raised Him from the dead, and set Him at His own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And hath put all things under His feet, and gave Him to be the head over all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Our inheritance. Since Father God has made Jesus Christ the heir of all things, Hebrews 1, 2, all the governments of heaven and earth, we believers in Christ also are heirs. We share His governmental authority in the heavens, just as redeemed Israel will share it in the earth. This is the future glorification we briefly noted earlier in Romans chapter 8. It bears repeating, and so we will be glad to repeat. Romans 8, and that glorification that we will talk about in the next lesson is described to some degree here in Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 2 and Philippians 3 and 1 Corinthians 15 and 2 Thessalonians 1 and 2 Thessalonians 2 and so on. Ephesians 1 8 wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Every member of the church, the body of Christ, will go to heaven. That is the heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Promise of Romans 8.17 Given to all who are children of God. Romans 8.16 For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3.26 Heaven is the inheritance of all Christians all members of the body of Christ, those who have trusted His finished cross work at Calvary as sufficient payment for their sins. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. 
We all share in His authority to rule over the heavenly places. Ephesians 2, 6 and 7. And Father God hath raised us up together, we're ascended, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come He might show the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus, the heavenly places. All individuals in Christ today qualify to reign in the heavenly places. However, are specific roles or jobs in heaven or conditional? The inheritance is unconditional. It doesn't depend on us. It depends on Christ. The reward of the inheritance, now that is conditional. Our entering heaven is unconditional, but our responsibility in heaven is conditional. Notice the word places. Ephesians 2, 6, places. Those are positions of authority. Revelation 12, 7, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. The great dragon there, verse 9, that old serpent, the devil, Satan. In the ages to come, God expels Satan and his fallen angels from outer space, the second heaven. They're cast to the earth. That is the spiritual wickedness in high places, heavenly places of Ephesians 6.12. The devil and his angels, the dragon and his angels, Satan and his angels, are thrown out of the second heaven. So God can install us, the church, the body of Christ, in those positions of government. Spheres of influence. That was Ephesians 1. Back to Ephesians 1. Verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things, all things in Christ, whether in heaven or earth. All things. What are the things? In Ephesians 1.10, uh, let's try Colossians 1. The sister epistle of Ephesians is Colossians. The sister epistle of Colossians is Ephesians. Colossians 1, 16. For by Him, Jesus Christ, God's dear Son, verse 13, 16. For by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. What are they? Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. And he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. The things or governmental offices, thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, mights, every name that's named, ranks of authority. It would help us here to consider Earth's governments, for they are similar to the structure of Heaven's governments. Qualifications are needed for each level of service. 
the more influential positions require greater qualifications. The qualifications not to go to heaven, but to serve in heaven. Or increasing amounts of sound Bible doctrine we stored in our soul while living on earth. The reward is not going to heaven. That is the inheritance. The reward of the inheritance is discharging specific duties in heaven. Be sure to keep them separate. Be sure to keep them separate. Be sure to keep them separate. We will repeat it over and over and over until it sinks in. The reward is not going to heaven. The inheritance is going to heaven. The reward of the inheritance is assuming specific responsibilities in heaven's governments. Colossians 3, Colossians 3, 23. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Oh, the preachers watching, the teachers watching, the professors watching, I'd better do right. I'd better say exactly what he or she wants to hear. Mm -mm. As unto the Lord, do it heartily with the heart. Faith, faith. Colossians 3.23 And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord, and not unto men. Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the inheritance, the reward of the inheritance. For ye serve the Lord Christ. See service here, service. Service, service, service. Romans 8 is about what? Uh, uh oh, oh. Service. See? See that? Romans 8. concentrates on our service on earth, but it ultimately looks toward our service in the heavenly places. Colossians 3, 23. Read it again. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. For ye serve the Lord Christ but he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done. And there is no respect of persons. So there's a reward. But there's also receiving something for the wrong which was done. Reward for doing right. But there's a loss of reward for doing wrong. This event is known as the judgment seat of Christ. Romans 14.10 Romans 14.10 But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Christ. Not the judgment seat of God is in the modern versions. You know why someone in Alexandria changed that verse? From Christos to Theos? Because they didn't want Christ being called God in Romans 14. 11 and 12 there, that's the Lord God. In Isaiah 45, 23, they want to separate Christ from being the Lord of Isaiah, Jehovah God. See? So they say, yes, Isaiah is talking about God. Isaiah is talking about Christ who is God. See the difference? Keep your King James Bible. Romans 14, 10. In modern versions, obscure the deity of Christ. They hide it. They eliminate it from that verse. You can't teach it from that verse in their versions. Romans 14, 11. For it is written, 
Isaiah 45, 23, And as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God, so then every one of us, believers, shall give account of himself to God, the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 9 and 10. Wherefore we labor, service, service, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him, service. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Remember the wrong of Colossians 3? There's the bad of 2 Corinthians 5. Whether he be guilty of good or bad, the things the things done in his body, not by the body, but in his body, what is done in the body? The inner man. The judgment seat of Christ is not to determine who will go to heaven and who will go to hell. The judgment seat of Christ is for believers in Christ only, the members of the church, the body of Christ alone. That was already settled on earth. Who goes to heaven, who goes to hell? When Christians believed on Jesus Christ, Christians alone are present here at the judgment seat of Christ. Children of God, heirs of God, joint heirs of Christ are the only people at the judgment seat of Christ. The matter that needs to be settled at the judgment seat of Christ is the spiritual maturity of individual Christians. What type of doctrine did they store in the inner man? Good teaching, dispensational Bible study, or bad teaching, everything else? What heavenly job will fit their level of Bible understanding? Will they sit on a throne like a king? or rule over a dominion like a lord, or reign over a principality like a prince, or govern like a power, other ruler, or be part of mites like a soldier, or be among every name that is named, general basic duties. Again, there are different ranks or offices or levels of heavenly government, just like earth's governments. Colossians 1.16, again, Colossians 1.16 Thrones, dominions, principalities, powers. Those are the things. Those are the created things. Ephesians 1.21 Principality, power, might, dominion, every name that's named. All those things. Those offices of government in heaven, they're invisible. But there are offices of government on earth. Those are visible. These are like presidents, kings, princes, military leaders, state governors, city mayors, and so on. They have varying degrees of authority, influence, that matches their education. Our education, our curriculum is Paul's epistles, Romans through Philemon. That is the material that we must know to function in the heavenly places for the Lord Jesus Christ's glory. We are going to heaven because of what Jesus Christ did for us at Calvary, unconditional. But what we do in heaven depends on what we do with the Bible now on earth, conditional. Do we study scripture or something else? Do we ignore Paul and read the rest of the Bible? If it is not God's word, rightly divide it. 2 Timothy 2.15 It is not applicable to God's will in heavenly places. It is the garbage material of 1 Corinthians 3, 9 to 15, amounting to nothing in eternity. 
First Corinthians three. First Corinthians three, nine to fifteen. For we are laborers, uh, service. We are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me, Paul, as a wise master builder, Paul has the blueprints. God wants a certain structure, an edifice of sound Bible doctrine, built up in our inner man. He wants to build it up by means of the indwelling Holy Spirit. The pattern, the design, is in Paul's epistles, Romans to Philemon. So if we take the doctrine outside of Paul, or we throw away the Bible altogether and follow tradition, then we don't have the building God wants. We have something else. He won't accept it. He will not accept our service because the foundation for our service is junk. What we put in here, the inner man, is what will be out here. The activity of the physical body. Me. First Corinthians 3.10 According to the grace of God which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. Be careful, watch out. It doesn't matter what Bible version you use. It doesn't matter where you go to church. What theological system you embrace. We all serve God. We all love Jesus. We all praise the Lord. <sighs> no, that's wrong. That is... Ooh. Yes. Bible ignorance. If you don't follow the blueprints, God will notice... You can fool others. You'll never fool him ever. Amen, 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 amen. It's true. Watch how you build. First Corinthians three eleven. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Paul is not the foundation. The preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, that is the foundation. Romans 16, 25 and 26. Jesus Christ, not according to prophecy, but according to mystery. The mystery view of Jesus Christ found in Romans to Philemon. First Corinthians three twelve. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, six materials. Right? You can count, huh? You don't need to be a mathematical genius. One, two, three, those are good. Four, five, six, those are bad. Every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Quality. Not quantity. Quality. Every man's work will be inspected. Every believer. The service of every member of the church, the body of Christ, will be reviewed at the judgment seat of Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ himself will look straight into our soul and see what's really there. Is it sound Bible doctrine? 
or junk. Traditions of men, philosophy, speculation, hunches, superstitious foolishness. He'll see it all. Yes, it's Pauline, or no, it's junk. One or the other. It's either good or it's trash. That's what you based your Christian life on? Yes. Well, that's what you did on earth. You won't be doing that in heaven. That useless material will not be welcome in heaven. And so there's a purging of the Christian soul in 1 Corinthians 3. Every Christian, all believers, all the useless material that they crammed into their soul, it's burned up. And it is tallied up to be zilch. Not a nothing. I did mission work. I went on missions trips. I passed out my denomination's literature. I already baptized 50,000 people. I gave tithes and offerings. I read the prayer book through 40 times. I got on my knees and groveled at confession. Every chance I got, oh, 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 oh I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I ate holy meals. But was it Christ in you or just you doing that? Oh, oh, see? We judge according to righteous judgment, not according to appearance. Well, that's how the Lord does it anyway. On the outside it looks good, but let's look at that heart. What's the motivation in the heart? First Corinthians 3, 14, If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Oh, that's the reward of the inheritance of Colossians 3. 15, If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. Not loss of a seat in heaven, but loss in the sense of a loss of reward. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. All that destructive material in his soul will no longer pollute him because Jesus Christ's purging work there burns up the wood hay stubble. All that remains is the gold, silver, and precious stones. Gold, silver, precious stones, sound Bible doctrine. Spiritual knowledge, spiritual wisdom, spiritual understanding, the Word of God rightly divided. Wood, hay, stubble? Well, that's everything else. That's the bad of Colossians 3. That's the eye, ear, and heart of 1 Corinthians 2.9 Eye, ear, heart Wood, hay, stubble Scientific method Traditions of men Intuition, speculation Wood, hay, stubble You won't be bringing that into my heavenly places I guarantee you of that I'll welcome you into heaven you're a member of the church, the body of Christ. But I'm going to clean you up in the soul first of all that filth, filthy doctrine that you stored inside. Again, the reward is not going to heaven. 
Heaven is the inheritance. The reward of the inheritance is fulfilling specific duties in heaven. The inheritance is not the reward. The inheritance is given to us because of Jesus Christ's finished work at Calvary's cross. We did not work to get into heaven. Now there is a reward associated with the inheritance. And that reward depends on the quality of our Christian service. It is not how much we did, but rather why we did what we did. Was it sound Bible doctrine working in us? Was it God's grace working in us, Pauline doctrine, or empty religious tradition? That is, was it grace living or legalism? Did we use grace doctrine or denominationalism? It matters. To the extent that we suffer in 2 Timothy chapter 2, that is the extent of our reigning in heaven. If we refuse to let Jesus Christ work in us using Paul's epistles, that is a loss of reward. And our duties in heaven will be diminished because we are unqualified to serve in certain heavenly governmental positions. We enter heaven, the inheritance, based on Calvary's finished cross work. We receive the reward of the inheritance based on the quality of doctrine we put in our soul. 1 Corinthians 3, 9-15, 2 Corinthians 5, 9 and 10, Colossians 3, 23-25. May we have gold, silver, precious stones, Pauline doctrine, and not wood, hay, stubble. Alas, most of us will largely have the useless information stored in our soul. The judgment seat of Christ will manifest it too. Much, much more could be written here, but this author trusts that enough material has been laid out for any Romans 8, 17 doubts to be dispelled. Those brethren who are willfully ignorant will have to remain willfully ignorant at this point. 1 Corinthians 14, 38 But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. We cannot help them at this point. Let them go on their way with their nonsense. The God of the Bible values free will, and so do we. Now, for those of us who want to hear and believe the words of the Holy Spirit, let us summarize and bring this study to a close. Romans 8, 17, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. Sadly, this precious verse has been used to divide Pauline dispensationalists and grace believers for the last four plus years. Almost ten now. The joint heir clause is taken as a conditional statement. Perhaps yes, perhaps no. Maybe we will be joint heirs with Christ, and maybe we will not. Here is the conditional joint heirship camp that we would do well to avoid. In this system, if so be is taken to mean we must suffer with Jesus Christ in order to become joint heirs with Him. We supposedly must suffer for the mystery's sake, sound Pauline doctrine, before we can qualify as joint heirs with Christ. God's grace is thus destroyed, having been perverted into a legalistic or works-oriented system. The way the first half of Romans 8.17 is structured allows us to see how to handle the latter half. If children is not questioning whether or not we are God's children, rather this is a fact Paul laid out to then lead us to two conclusions. Since we are one God's children, then we are two His heirs. Since we are two His heirs, then we are three joint heirs with Christ. These three qualities go together. All three apply to all Christians. We do not force the first two to apply to some Christians and make the third pertain only to a special group of Christians, namely those believers suffering for the mystery. If suffering for the mystery's sake resulted in being a joint heir with Christ, then why did Paul not mention that very term in 2 Timothy 2? After all, he himself was suffering for preaching his gospel, part of the mystery. Why joint heir never appears in 2 Timothy is because this suffering is not the same as the suffering of Romans 8.17. Romans speaks of suffering with him, with Christ. 
a suffering isolated from the suffering of 2 Timothy. The Greek word in Romans 8.17, the controversial if so be, is eper or iper, E-I-P-E-R. It always forms the heart of a chain of logic. Never is doubt being gendered in its four remaining instances, Romans 8.9, 1 Corinthians 15, 15, 2 Thessalonians 1, 6, and 1 Peter 2, 3. Possibilities are not here. Certainties are. They are progressions of thought, laying out arguments to form conclusions. The remaining instance of I pair, or a pair, is Romans 8, 17, if so be. In keeping with the data, data Romans 8, 17 is logical and not conditional. We must be consistent. Since we are children of God, verse 16, we are His heirs by default, verse 17. The second if of verse 17 functions the same way as the first if in verse 17. If we suffer with Him, and we will, as this is definite, certain, not speculative, Romans 8, 18, suffering, then that suffering will eventually result in glorification. As we share in his sufferings, so we will partake of his glorification. This is not conditional, but logical. Again, go back to the first if of verse 17. If necessary, you may even go back to verse 16, where the sentence starts. We are heirs of God, and we are joint heirs with Christ. Both are facts because of the fact that we are children of God. These three are facts, not possibilities or conditional ideas. They are certainties. All Christians are children of God, all believers in Christ are heirs of God, and thus all Christians are joint heirs with Christ. Anyone who uses Romans 8.17 to teach conditional joint heirship, that we must suffer for the mystery's sake to be joint heirs with Christ, is most definitely promoting false teaching. Even one hint of a performance-based acceptance system slipping into the body automatically negates the Holy Spirit's working in grace. If ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Galatians 5.18 A little leaven leaveneth the whole up. Galatians 5.9 If we let just a little bit of works religion in, the whole law system will find its way into our hearts and minds. If we must strive and mature in doctrine to be joint heirs with Christ, then that is works, not grace. Once we go that route, we are susceptible to using all of Romans 8, 17, the other if, so as to teach we become God's children and God's heirs only by suffering with Christ. Oh, False teaching will increase unto more ungodliness if we do not stop it in its early stages. 2 Timothy 2, 16 Be on guard! Beware! Be on guard! Beware! Be on guard! Beware! The system of conditional joint heirship also ignores the fact that the Romans, Romans 8.32, He that spared not his son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Colossians, Colossians 2.10, And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Ephesians. Ephesians 1.3 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. The system of conditional joint heirship also ignores the fact that the Romans, Colossians, Ephesians, and all other Christians are blessed with all that Father God has to offer. We do not have to strive to be joint heirs with Christ. God gave that already to all of us in Christ the moment we trusted Christ. Must we strive to obtain everything that is Christ's? Did we not already get everything that is His the moment the Holy Spirit put us into Jesus Christ? 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Why, yes, He did. 
If anyone tells us that all Christians are heirs of God, but only the edified according to Paul's epistles are joint heirs with Christ, we can dismiss them as advocating a works gospel. Grace is tainted, canceled, or frustrated. Galatians 2.21 We work for reward. Colossians 3.23-25 The reward of the inheritance. We do not work for the inheritance, namely heaven. Ephesians 1, 3 to 23, Ephesians 2, 1 to 10. The conditional joint heirship, brethren, whether they realize it or not, that is beside the point. The conditional joint heirship, brethren, are making it sound like we work to get into heaven. They have confused the inheritance with the reward of the inheritance. Friends, we had better learn to differentiate the two. All members of the church, the body of Christ, will be glorified in the heavenly places by virtue of being heirs of God. And all Christians will be glorified in the heavenly places by virtue of being joint heirs with Christ. Since we are suffering with Christ now, it only stands to reason we will be glorified with Him in the future. You suffer now, but you will be glorified later. As we partake of His sufferings, so we will share in His glory. That is the glorious truth in Romans 8, 17, given to all believers in Jesus Christ. We will reign in the heavenly places with Him, Ephesians 2, 6, and 7. That is the inheritance, solely dependent on Jesus Christ paying the price with His shed blood at Calvary. Ephesians 1, 3 to 14. But exactly what tasks do we undertake once we get into heaven? Here is the reward of the inheritance. Our rank office within the heavenly places is directly proportional to the quality of doctrine we stored in our inner man. 1 Corinthians 3, 9 to 15, 2 Corinthians 5, 9 and 10, Colossians 3, 23 to 25. This is our Christian service, how we let our position given us in Christ daily affect us in mind and body while living on earth. Here is where Christian good works are. That is why we constantly stress here that sound Bible doctrine matters. Pauline dispensationalism matters. Christian friend, if you are not applying to life a clear understanding of Paul's epistles, Romans through Philemon, then your Christian life is not pleasing to God. That is why you are deceived, confused, struggling, disappointed, and miserable. Romans 7. Your Christian life is not functioning as God intended because you are not using the doctrine He intended for Christian living. You are relying on church tradition, non-Pauline doctrine, human viewpoint, and that amounts to nothing in light of eternity. There is no power of God therein. Start reading the book of Romans and believe what you read. In doing so, you will spare yourself so much spiritual darkness. You will save yourself so much time groping, wandering, wondering, doubting, and struggling. This author can testify to that firsthand, and so can countless other saints. Amen, 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 amen. That's Romans 8, 17. We went long. I ask for your forgiveness. Not that long. That's sufficient. We could have gone longer. That's enough. Thank you, Father God, for this light. In Christ's name, amen.